Hello everyone, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, over the Bowie, yeah. Hello, I'm Jack, um, Jack Ellis, and I'll be moderating this panel today, but I'm, I'm a sort of panellist moderator, so I'll also be contributing my thoughts and ideas. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Gadigal land, um, pay my respects to Gadigal elders, past, present and future, um, and in particular any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here now. And also, I suppose, acknowledge that a lot of Gadigal stories have been told on this land before and hopefully will continue to be called, told on this land. So, thank you. Um, so, what we uh, agreed, because I'm uh, panelling and moderating, is that I would read a brief description of, um, uh, sort of, a brief introduction of each of the panellists, and you can all cheer and be happy for them. And... Um, you can dance or sing or shout. And um, then I would ask a specific question to each of them. Um, and then we would have a more general discussion on the theme, which, as you know, is what is happening to how men explore their identity in books and a longer bit. All right. So <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and I'll start by introducing our panel. So um, first of all, and a bit out of order, um, Luke Carmen in the middle here. Um, is a writer from Liverpool, Sydney, uh, whose first book, An Elegant Young Man, was published in 2013. An essay collection on the writing life, Intimate Antipathies, followed in 2019. And he has a short story collection entitled An Ordinary Ecstasy, due out later this year. Please make Luke come and welcome. Thank you. Um, on the left there, Tom Patterson. Uh, he grew up in New e the New England region of New South Wales. And his first book, Missing, uh, is a biography of Mark May, who lived for 35 years as a hermit in remote, uh, remote country east of Armadale. Uh, and an and extract of Missing won a Walkley Award. Thank you to Tom. And here, Luke Johnson. Um, so we've got two Lukes, Luke Johnson and Luke Carmen. Um, Luke Johnson was born and raised in Young, New South Wales. His short stories have been published in numerous Australian journals and listed for such awards as the Josephine Ulrich Prize, the Elizabeth Jolly Prize, the AAWP Chapter One Prize, the Albury City Short Story Prize, the Catherine Susanna Pritchard Speculative Fiction Award, and two Verona Publisher Introduction Program Fellowships. He's the author of a short story collection, Ferocious Animals, which was published last year, and he lectures in creative writing at the University of Wollongong. So please make Luke Johnson welcome. And then me. Um, so I'm Jack Ellis. Um, I'm from Sydney. Um, my first novel, The Best Feeling of All, was published in 2014. And my second novel, Home and Other Hiding Places, which you can buy over there, as, long as, as well as all these guys' books, um, was published in February uh, this year. Um, the book, that book, uh, Home and Other Hiding Places, is written for adult readers, but it's from the perspective of an eight-year-old boy um, who's, who lives with a pretty chaotic mother with very fragile mental health. And that book begins when um, the boy and his mum come down from their little farmhouse in the northern rivers of uh, New South Wales to stay with um, uh, his gran in Sydney. And essentially, it's a, a book about a boy who sets out on a series of dangerous adventures um, because he's totally unsupervised um, while the adults in his life are just preoccupied with their own stuff. So please make me welcome. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So as I said, we agreed we, I'd start by asking a specific question to each of the panel. And then we'd have a bit of a conversation. And then at the end, we've got time for questions as well. And we're running a little bit late, but we'll try and stick to time. Um, all right, so firstly, um, to Luke uh, Johnson, um, and it's a segue because the first book in your, the first story in your book is also about an eight-year-old. Um, and that, the title of that story is When We Were Eight Together. And um, early in the story, there's a moment when uh, the boy's dad comes to collect him from school and you write... I'm Michael's dad, he said, Michael's father. It seemed to take all the air in his chest just to say these few words. After saying them, he looked like he was going to collapse or start crying. 
He put his hand out and touched the door handle to steady himself. His knuckles had grease on them. He was not the kind of man to cry. I don't think I'd ever seen him cry. And then once Michael leaves the classroom, his dad is so kind of overcome with emotion that he, he, can't, he can't even say what he's come to say. And then later in the book, you've, you've also got another story called The Names of Dead Horses, and you give us another man kind of who can't speak, it's restraining. He sounds like he has a strange accent because he's trying not to cry. And so these speechless men who kind of can't even allow themselves the expression of tears seem very different to the act of writing and very different to, you know, which is all about words. And so why is it that you, through writing, have presented us with these speechless kind of archetypical men who won't let themselves express sadness or emotion? Why is it important to you? Um, that's a good question, and, and that was a nice reading. Thanks. I think you did it better than I could have done it. Um, there's something, uh, there's certainly no coincidence about the fact the kind of family that I grew up in probably was made up of these archetypical sort of men, um, and I think I was raised to, for the most part, be that kind of man as well. And there's an oddity about that because, of course, inside there's this kind of swirling ocean of emotion quite often um, that you feel needs to stay in there and writing becomes a vehicle through which... Well, it's, there's, there's artifice involved. It feels like... Um, it feels like a kind of safer way of engaging with those ideas. There's also something about the nature of language itself which I have an uneasy relationship with. It's sort of happening to me right now where I'm just not being as articulate in real life as I wish I could be. And, you know, I want to go back on the drive home after this. I'll be editing this little speech and thinking about all the clever things I should have said. And writing is um, a medium or a practice through which you can alter those moments and you can revisit those moments. And the event in that story with the father showing up at the primary school and the kid sort of seeing him and realising that something's amiss and misinterpreting it at, to begin with, seeing it as an exciting um, prospect that he's getting let off from school early um, is, is more or less based on something that happened in real life. You know, I was in year three and my dad shows up from um, the garage where he worked and I was sort of a legend because he interrupted the class and the teacher had to go out and we all sort of went wild while she was gone. And you sort of... But there's something going... There's something not quite right about this moment... And, uh, I, you know, writing is this retroactive kind of act for me where I can revisit those moments in the past and spend a little bit more time with them um, to kind of rest, W-R-E-S-T, um, rest the, the sort of big moments away from the temporal line, or, or, or the temporality of life, which never slows down for those things. It just marches on and clearly certain moments have a bigger impact on us when we're living them and... That's what writing affords, the opportunity to go back and give a voice to those, um, those moments where, you know, speech failed. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks. Um, did you want to say something, Tom? Or... Okay, no worries. Um, well, I'll stick to um, a specific question now to Luke Carmen, if that's all right. Um, hopefully this format's working for everyone. We'll get a conversation going. Yep. Um, all right, so this, um, I'm, I've got a little quote here from your, um, your story, Portrait of the Artist in Residence, which I think you have to admit is a fantastic title. Um, and there's, in that story, there's the following passage. It says, it's, you write, Eddie scoffed when I mentioned loving old man and the sea for its flagellant misery. I didn't mind him scoffing at my readings, but the next thing I knew, his tobacco breath slid into my nostrils. He leant towards me on his pool cue like a gargoyle clinging to a door frame and he said, Hemingway's problem was that he was afraid he'd never be as much of a man as Gertrude Stein. <laughs> um, and I also like the line on the same page, which is, you won't learn anything stuck in your room like a hamster in a colon. Yeah. <laughs> which I suppose both quotes are about male fragility in one way or another. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, and so I'm not sure if this really says anything about Hemingway or, or his friendship with Gertrude Stein, um, but it, I think it does talk about 
men defining themselves, men feeling fragile about their identities, sometimes defining themselves by what they're not rather than what they are. Um, but many of your stories are deeply personal, first-person accounts of fragility and vulnerability. And so could you talk a bit about the, the importance of honesty as a male writer and your decision to be so open, so honest and so vulnerable in your first-person writing? Yeah, OK. Um, first of all, I don't know, because, it, for example, that essay uh, is from Intimate Antipathies, which is an e sold as an essay collection. But to tell you the truth, some of them are just uh, pieces of fiction uh, disguised as essays. So, for example, that piece, uh, it was a fiction piece that I published for a magazine in the UK. And uh, when I was putting the essay collection together, uh, I said, well, maybe I can stick it in there and uh, just pretend it was an essay all along. And I don't think there's much difference uh, between my essays and my fiction because fundamentally I consider myself to be a writer first, a fiction writer first. So the honesty isn't really there in a way. Like, it's, it seems like honesty, but it's fiction. So, uh, for example, I, my first book, uh, An Elegant Young Man, the protagonist was Luke Francis Carmen, which just so happens to be my name. Uh, Luke Francis Carmen lived in the same house and the same street as I do. But as far as I was concerned, that was just to emphasise how fictional this person was. It's not me at all. And that's not a revolutionary thing. That's an old kind of technique. You know, you make it seem as, uh, as much a mirror as possible so that you're kind of deflecting yourself. And it gets me into trouble. So with the, with the essay collection, I wrote a lot of essays where the characters would do appalling things or terrible things or have terrible, stupid, puerile thoughts like hamsters in colons and things like that, but I intended the audience to take that as a kind of character. You know, it's not me saying it. So, for example, there was one essay uh, about this experience I had, which was great, where I went to Byron Bay with some writers, fantastic writers, uh, 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 Mr. Merrill, who will be here later on, Kate Forsyth, uh, Jesse Blackadder, who has sadly passed, fantastic Australian writers. And I had the character saying, oh, well, none of these... He looked at the bios and he's like, none of these people look like serious writers to me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And people were saying, why were you so disrespectful to these other great Australian writers? And it's like, why? Well, I wasn't. It was a character. You know, this thing is fictional. It's, it's meant to... I'm trying to set up a dramatic uh, tension here. And um, so I always felt like it was never that honest. I was never being myself. I don't feel like I am ever really being myself. I feel like a fictional person. So, like, even when I'm in an environment like this and I'm, I'm talking, I, I relate sort of like to what Luke was saying, you know, like uh, the other Luke. Um, you know, what I'm saying here is fiction in the sense that my brain is wired that way. Uh, I could say something here in this context about the work, but uh, it's really just the computational process that I would use to create a work of fiction anyway. So, I don't know, I don't feel exposed really. Uh, I don't feel like it's me in the, the essay collections or in the fiction. It's just a character. Um, but I, I know that in the fragility, the vulnerability and all that sort of stuff comes from having the opposite experience. My, my father was not an archetypical, uh, repressive kind of stoic character. He, uh, the storm of emotion wasn't inside him, hidden away. It was all over the place, everywhere. He just couldn't stop uh, releasing it. Um, so I do relate to... The one side I do relate to is I'm completely inarticulate and incoherent and I'm very envious of people who have the gift of the gab and can just talk and say what they want to say. Uh, and I've retreated to fiction and writing because I can't do that in the day-to-day, -day, on the moment, uh, in my personal interactions. I have to do it on the page. So uh, that's, my, that's my response. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, no thank you. Um, all right, and Tom, uh, so in your book, Missing, your biography of Mark May, um, you bring us a young man who's sort of facing emotional pain and confusion, and what he then does is walk into the bush and out near Armidale and then live there alone for the next 35 years. Um, and I suppose whereas archetypically we might expect a woman who is struggling to seek connection, um, to talk, you know, to seek, you know, friendship or things... He just completely isolates himself in the bush. And although he's also a diarist and a letter writer, he, he never shares those diaries and letters, ultimately. So can you talk about what you found so special about Mark's story? And this is a panel about masculinity, I suppose, and, and that kind of masculine imperative to isolate and hide when things are tricky. 
Sure. So um, uh, it's something I only thought about really once the book was done. I never thought about the masculinity of the characters or the absence of it. And in some ways it's a really masculine family that I'm writing about. So the f Mark's father, Phil, was this incredible figure. He was a market gardener's son, somehow got himself a scholarship to St Joseph's Scholar College, um, matriculated at the age of 16, didn't have any money, so he went timber cutting at Dorigo um, to get himself enough money to go to university. He then worked on the wharves and was a boxer. He was a prize fighter. Um, he was a rugby player. He was a statistician. And the bloke I'm writing about, Mark, um, wasn't that. And his father, uh, Mark's father, Phil, was trying to sort of transmit this way of life that Mark really didn't respond to. He really didn't like it. And <clears throat> part of Mark's problem was trying, basically trying to find a masculinity in himself that he could really um, live up to. He was very nostalgic about his father, um, but also uh, in society as well. Um, the retreat thing, yeah, I, it, uh, for Mark, it was, it appeared to be, um, he tried everything in society and it just hadn't worked. And where he felt comfortable was the bush. Um, and that's where he went. That's where he went for 35 years. Well, thank you. Um, and because I'm meant to be a panellist too, um, I'm going to read a little, uh, couple of paragraphs from my latest book um, and then ask myself a question, I suppose. I'll ask uh, you a question, Jack. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, in your book, this is, this is completely unscripted, in your yeah. book, Home and Other Hiding Places, yeah. you've got your eight-year-old boy who is um, essentially without a father figure trying to chart through this life. How is that? Well, it's interesting, I mean, and I think, uh, to deflect from my own book for a moment, but there's, you write a beautiful story, Luke Carmen too, called The, uh, the Myth of Western Sydney, I think it's called, or, yeah. Um, and did, did your dad really work walking centre point? Tower? Yeah, he did, so that was real, yeah. And, um, but there's this theme of, of boys pining for their fathers in a few stories on this panel, and um, I think... Um, one of the challenges, I think, for boys and young men when you're learning... Well, I think it's also curious to think about what the difference is between a boy and a man, which is something we might discuss later. But um, I think that when you are a boy, you are looking to the men in your life to sort of provide a kind of compass points of morality and identity. And when they are not there... Um, you begin to kind of create a mythology of your own. And so quite often, and I work in my job as a family mediator, and I, I'll see these, these boys whose dads are not great men. Um, and I think, just to segue, I think that sometimes, one of the themes of my writing too, is that sometimes the most responsible thing a father can do is to go away. Um, and I think that's a more complicated aspect of the question. But um, what ends up happening is they become mythologised, these absent dads. They become superheroes. They become these people who were, you know, through no fault of, the fault of their own absented. And, and I think what that means is that you invariably, when there's an absent father, you look then to women, I think, to define what a man is and what a boy is. And it goes back to that thing we were talking about of defining yourself by what you're not. Um, and so... Uh, what I might do now is sort of loop back to my little reading, which is, um, so at this stage, um, uh, Finn, the central character who's eight years old, is um, he's just making a sort of male friendship, really, for the first time. And with Rory, cheers for Rory, who's everybody's favourite Rory, yeah. Um, and uh, he's sitting out on the patio with his um, great-grand stepmother, uh, Josie, um, and they're talking about Rory, the boy that he's just met, who lives next door to Gran and Josie. Um, Josie invited Finn to sit on the patio. She brought her little radio out and they listened to classical music while she blew smoke into the back of the fan. Finn told her about Rory's sandwich recipe and offered to make them both one. But Josie said there were no pickles in the house because they repeat on Gran. So he made himself a tomato sauce sandwich, 
and rolled his golf ball between his bare feet, checking the backyard again and again for any sign of Rory. He thought about climbing through the tunnel in the bush and knocking, but Rory had said Pop didn't like visitors. Waiting for your friend? Josie asked. Yes, Rory. I know, that's a nice name. You seem to miss him a whole lot all of a sudden. Yes. Finn remembered how he'd felt when Rory had disappeared the first time, like his own stomach had gone too. Josie said, friends are good. About as good as it gets, I'd say. But maybe marriage is better. Yes. Finding someone you want to marry is even better. They're like a friend, but you get to live in the same house. Finn could tell Josie was missing her husband, Gran's dad, and he said, if it's better, I'd like to marry Rory. And the idea filled him with a warm feeling like runny sunlight. Boys can get married, can't they? Josie thought for a moment. Not here, only in New Zealand. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yes, and that's also a boy who's been raised without his dad and only has one vague memory of his dad when he was little, which was his dad feeding a pelican, uh, a sardine, uh, out of a tin. Um, okay, and so, as we know, this panel is meant to be about what is happening to, the, to how men explore um, masculinity in books and their identity in books. And so, we also know that we live in a patriarchy um, that is structurally designed to maintain male power. But in the stories we've heard um, about men who can't cry, men who can't speak, um, men who isolate themselves because they're overwhelmed, and in your wonderful story, The Cold of Western Sydney, um, a boy pining for his father and not, you know, connecting. Um, these male characters that we're writing about and a, a little boy in my book who's experiencing sort of male-male love for the first time and doesn't know how to fit it into, you know, just the normal territory of friendship. They don't sound very powerful and this sounds quite different to what, you know, the patriarchal system is all about. And so, as I said, the question in the, in the, um, in the blurb says, what is happening to how men explore identity in books and why is it that we're writing about men and boys who are kind of the opposite of powerful. Throw that to the panel. Um, I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that uh, I, I think that generally writers or what I think, uh, what I think a writer is, is they, they're coming generally from a place where they're, they're an outsider in some way, they're an exile in some way, they're someone who's at least a little bit, uh, has a little discontent with the way things are. And uh, I have a friend, uh, uh, a writer, for a New Zealand writer, um, who uh, told me that in his opinion, writers were the true proletariat. They're the true underclass. And uh, I think um, there is something about that, you know, like uh, not just male writers, but all writers. Uh, they're, they're, they're coming from a place where at least in some way their imagination is preferable to some degree to the reality around them. And so they're, they're disempowered uh, by nature, I think, and they're, they're unnaturally disinclined towards power, in, in my experience. And, and so I think that there may just be a, a causal connection there with uh, men who've had, uh, you know, take, let's say, assume, for example, for instance, that what you're saying is true about the, the power structure, then maybe it just so happens that men who generally tend towards uh, wasting their time largely in the enterprise of producing fiction which has no rewards in reality, no monetary rewards, no kudos, no, uh, uh, no cultural reward for most of us, um, that they only do so because they've accepted prima facie that they don't belong in the power structure at all and they should just give up even trying to participate in it. Um, I don't know if that's the answer, but that's what seems to me to be likely. And it's probably, it may be the case as why some of the examples here are mythologizing a father figure. 
uh, and being obsessive about that in your imaginative uh, enterprise, possibly? I think it probably speaks to the difference, the, the question you raised there probably speaks to the difference between ideology and art, and we are all aware of those kind of um, larger narratives that exist that are constantly telling us that we're the benefactors of X amount of thousands of years worth of um, sitting at the top of the power hierarchy, but for a lot of people, the lived experience is quite different to that, and art opens up... Um, <laughs> Art opens up a space to explore that terrain um, for lots of people who, I mean, we're seeing it play out now in politics um, with, with the revolt against some of these, um, these dogmas. Uh, you know, the US is a classic example where disenfranchised young men are not buying into the narrative that tells them that they're at the top of the power structure and that they, you know, need to sort of bow down and, you know, step aside because for a lot of them that's not the lived experience of their lives. They're impoverished, they're undereducated, they come from broken homes, they're, they're suffering. And um, I, I suppose those bigger narratives are important and I don't think politics can afford to be nuanced quite often so it makes sense but art needs to be nuanced and it's no surprise to me at all that the characters that we see in fiction or creative non-fiction don't resemble the characters that we see um, being talked about by politicians or cultural leaders. I think we're dealing with two entirely different phenomena there. Hmm. Tom, anything you like? Um, look, I really like the, um, the shift towards this more, I don't know, sensitive perhaps male voice but look I also miss the big Dionysian figures I would love to see another Hemingway I would love to see another Robert Hughes um, I'd love you know that's those really sort of big characters to sort of take on some of this stuff not always right not always kind but yeah there's sort of this there is a, a fascination there and, a, and an interest that um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see more of it um, when you talk about Dionysian figures like Hemingway, one of the things I suppose that, that tells us that Hemingway is a man and tells us that he's a male writer perhaps is this kind of tendency towards short sentence, you know, verb subject, ob object sort of syntax. Right? And so I suppose, and if we think about the earlier example in yours, um, Luke Johnson, the story which was, um, sorry, uh, you describe, you say, he put out his hand and touched the door handle to steady himself. His knuckles had grease on them. He was not the kind of man to cry. This classic, almost Hemingway-esque, short sentence syntax. And, um, and in your um, book, I've got too many pieces of paper here, um, Missing, um, there's an example where you're describing what... Um, what Mark's doing, and um, uh, this your, in your book, Tom, um, and it goes, he throws slow jabs between the skin and the selvage of the swinging carcass. It's better up close like this, and Mark finds the animal warmth comforting. But when Phil slits the belly, the smell hits Mark, and he's throwing up before he realises it. Don't be soft. A man has got to do the dirty work in life. You've got to get hard or you won't survive. Now, I think it's probably just even from the syntactic structure and rhythm of those sentences, you can tell that you're writing either about men or it's a man writing. What is it about syntax and the structure and the sort of rhythmic and stylistic choices that I suppose masculinise our writing and what do they say about masculinity, do you think? Can someone else answer that? That's too big for me. <laughs> I mean, that's a... Um, it's... It's true what you're saying, but it's also a kind of cherry-picked quote. If you read on to other stories, they're quite verbose and loquacious. And certainly if you read Carmen's writing, he doesn't mind a sentence with a few commas in it um, and parenthetical phrases I've and I've so got, on. I've got uh, three sentences here that go a full page. Yeah. <laughs> so that to me is just something more about stylistics than it is necessarily necessarily about the masculine experience. Um, I think it was Norman Mailer who said he doesn't trust any writer that hasn't tried to imitate Hemingway at some point <laughs> in his career. And it's just a very influential um, voice. It's an appealing voice. It's deceptively simple. The first time you read it, you think, holy hell, that's amazing, but look how easy it is. I can do that. 
And I don't know, it's the difference between um, a, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a symphony and a, and a solo piece played on, on the piano or on a single instrument. As a writer, you, well, as in my experience, I'm drawn to both of those timbres, that both of those kinds of extremes. So that's a story where definitely I'm um, more interested in uh, in what's happening between the sentences. So the more spaces that I can create with full stops, um, the more room there is for readerly contemplation. But you know, there are other stories in the collection where the opposite is true. Thank you, and Luke. Carmen, um, is there anything you'd like to I mean, because I think it is fair to say that on average, your sentences are probably longer than all three of ours put together. So anything you'd like to say about that? I would say they're probably not really technically sentences a lot of the time. But I think it's interesting because there's, you know, you have a counterexample, say, like the f when I was at uh, university, uh, there was this idea that a lot of the, you know, university uh, studying creative writing overwhelmingly as it is, uh, in the demographics of people who buy books is going to be overwhelmingly women. Uh, you know, if you've ever done a creative writing course, uh, you're going to be one of two uh, men in the room, generally speaking. Uh, it's generally buying books. Uh, the, the demographic that buys books, especially novels and fiction, is overwhelmingly, it's women. And um, so when I was studying, and there was one or two guys in the class, Everybody wanted to be Raymond Carver, um, and Raymond Carver was famous for being a minimalist. And there was, a, you know, he was able to create great effects from very uh, uh, minimal syntactical formulations, and that was that was really appealing. But on the other end of it, how many young men wanted to be, you know, uh, a neo Jack Kerouac, where the syntactical uh, uh, abundance and elaboration was the whole the whole game, and it was just you know, like a, a constant superfluidity of, of adjectives and uh, endless uh, kind of uh, Catholic uh, uh, sort of Baroque imagery. And, and that was really appealing to me. And don't forget, you know, Jack Kerouac, he's a, basically, he was a footy player. Uh, he's probably one of the most handsome uh, male writers ever, one of the fittest, even brags in, uh, you know, on the road that he's stronger than any of the men he's ever come across in his life. And, uh, you know, so he was a really masculine writer but he you know he was he was uh, super abundant uh, he wasn't the minimalist and i think in australian culture generally the, the australian literature for some reason it has fallen generally into two camps one is the elaborator and the other is the minimalist uh and i, I think you know um it, there is something to be said about um either camp but you know the, one thing you don't want to get caught into is this idea that the terse, ironic comment is the masculine way of expressing yourself. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but uh, yeah, I, I, I certainly prefer uh, the long, elaborate, sometimes incoherent and rambling response. Yeah. And I, if you want an excellent example, a masterclass in um, in elaborative masculine writing, then the cult of Western Sydney, you know, in, the, in your book for sale over there, um, is an excellent example. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. So three intellectual answers, and I'm going to give you a much more a feeling. I, I write until it sounds sweet, and then I try and stop before I wreck it. That's all I do. So like, I, I, I can recognise all of this, but it's a bit different for me. Great, thank you. Now we need to wind up shortly, and thank you. We are running a little bit late. But just as I suppose, a final question to everybody before we take some questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, uh, Dina's got a microphone that um, you can use in a sec. Um, but um, I suppose what, what we've heard, and it's not universally true, is that we are generally writing about male characters, we're generally writing about boys and, and men. And what do you think about us male writers writing about characters who, from other gender identities, other things, is it, can it ever be authentic? Is it important that we do it? Is it just appropriation? What do you think about kind of staying in your lane or as opposed to writing the perspectives of other people as a male writer particularly? Um, that's a career ending question. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, I, Anytime. I won't, I, rather than toe the party line, um, I, I will say that <laughs> 
that's a dogma that I can't get behind. I think um, I think there's good writing and there's bad writing, and sure, there are a lot of times where bad writing is, you know, a guy like me trying to speak from the point of view of somebody that he isn't. But the crime there is not the appropriation of the voice because done well, that can be an act of great empathy. Um, it's when it's done poorly that, that it offends. Um, so the crime, I think, is, is the crime against writing more than anything. Um, yeah, did I just end my career? I'm not sure. Yeah, quick note of support. So um, I'm with Luke on this one. Uh, it's, I, I understand the, 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 the sort of the gesture and the, um, the drive to, to look at it, but in fiction, nothing's, it's, it's, the great, it's the great art form. Nothing's off limits. You think about Lolita, that is a story told in the first person about a pederast, and it is perhaps the greatest novel of the 20th century. You can do it, you've just got to be really good. I think the fact that uh, we have four white males uh, taking up this space in the panel proves that none of us are uh, participating in the uh, the kind of lane uh, issue that you're describing. But I, I have complete empathy, and anyone who look, anyone who decides they have nothing to say and wishes to abandon the enterprise of writing, which is largely an unbroken chain of rejection and despair and defeat and failure and uh, embarrassment. They have my sympathies and uh, my, I'm totally uh, uh, not going to hold it against them. Um, but, you know, if you're doing it for the purposes of white guilt, eh, yeah, I'm, not really, uh, I'm not really sure that that's the right thing to do. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, so I think Dana's now giving us the question signal. So we've got a couple of questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just try and capture everyone here. I think I saw you first. Hi, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed everything you've had to say today. Um, I'm in an all-male book club who also played as a football team together when we were younger. Um, I've got a uh, close relative who's on the, the trans journey and I've had quite a few conversations with them about the notion of binary and non-binary and I'm just wondering what you think that the ideas that the LGBT community are putting forward, what opportunities they, they offer to men to become who they really might be underneath. I don't know why I reached for my microphone first. Um, look, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't know that I know the answer to that. I, I have no first-hand experience. Um, the opportunities that it might offer, I'm always perplexed by this notion of to become who you really are. I'm amazed that anyone thinks they know who they really are. In fact, I'm kind of dubious. I don't, that's not a, I don't direct that towards necessarily people and their sexuality, I just mean in general, thinking that you have a clear understanding of who you are is astounding to me because I sure as hell don't feel that way about myself. Um, but if there are people out there that feel that they've found who they really are and are progressing towards uncovering that in a more holistic way, then uh, pff, good, great. Uh, what is there not to like? Um, look, I don't have the urge to write something like that, but I'm very curious about books... I'm very curious of that world. It's, it's very interesting to me. Um, I said before that Lolita, perhaps, is the great novel of the 20th century. Um, has anyone read The Twyborn Affair by Patrick White? So uh, the book's in three parts. Um, first, the character is Edith, then Eddie, then Eudaxia. Um, White saw himself as a woman in a man's body, and it is just the most astonishing thing. It's the most... Um, fabulous piece of art and there's this incredible moment at the end where the bombs are raining down in London and he, um, Eudaxia meets their mother and it's just amazing. So um, yeah, it's, it's art I enjoy. Thank you. Um, um, I've got another question yeah. here. Hi guys, this is a great discussion. I hope it uh, continues down the pub afterwards. Um, uh, Jack, you were talking about archetypes at the beginning, and I'm wondering 
and having just heard um, Patrick White's name come up, whether Australian male archetypes have changed since the ones that he presented in books like Voss and Tree of Man and so on. Um, and if that's anything to do with the current sort of feeling that masculinity is so often associated with the word toxic, does that stop the expression of masculinity these days or does it hamper or change it in any way, I'm wondering? Well, thank you for your question and I hope the, the conversation continues at the pub too. Um, it, I mean, I think it's a complex question in the sense that I, I suspect the archetypes themselves haven't changed in the sense that, I mean, I went to the Bob Hawke mausoleum the other day and it was amazing and I highly recommend it and go and have a beer there. But that archetype of the male ha exists still, I think, in all of our minds. Um, uh, but I think the way we define ourselves is sometimes by what we're not. And I think that the aspect of your question that's about toxicity and male toxicity means that for a lot of men who care, a lot of men who feel, a lot of men who think, um, their most respectful decision is to stay silent. And that actually not having a voice about what a man should be or a man is or a man should be presented has become, I think, a bit of a risk. And I suppose the risk that I see is that the caring, progressive men amongst us end up out of respect and deference for you know, the history of the world and the injustices of it, end up staying silent. And we end up with this shouty, right-wing, Trumpian um, kind of model of masculinity. And I wonder, for boys now, and I've got a, a boy who's 10 years old, um, if they're not hearing caring, compassionate voices, how do we go about, as men, curating empathy in those boys? And so I think the answer is, yes, it has changed, but my fear is it's changed to a quieter kind of anti-definition of male archetypes, that I am not toxic, I am not this, I am not this, without a real positive example of what males are. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I think it's important. And I mean, I think it's fair to say that when I saw that oh, we were going to be four blokes on a panel, I was sort of a bit surprised. And, um, and, and for me, the, the fact that I was surprised and that to some extent it was almost even unthinkable means that it's a conversation we start needing to have. And I think we need as men to start putting forward positive um, voiced um, models of masculinity for the generations that come, because otherwise we'll be shouted down by the Trumps and the, the right-wingers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll make this the last question. Um, and please, you know, if there's anything you need to ask, um, the authors will be around. So last question to you. Thanks so much. What a great panel. I thought we should end with a female voice, so you're welcome. Um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that all of the authors that you guys have cited today have been um, sometimes alcoholic, abusive nutcases who have been very self-destructive. I thought in a positive note to end this on, and especially to bring it back home onto home shores, could you guys um, give us a bit of an insight into some of the Australian female voices that you've taken great inspiration from and talk a little bit about um, the need for acknowledgement, just not of masculinity, but Jack, of the idea that you put forward that, um, that a lot of men and masculine ideals come through the reflections of the female gaze. Thank you for your question. Um, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll have a go. Um, I, Tom, you, I think you had something to say, sorry. Oh, well, I'm just going to jump in and say Helen Garner. She's fabulous. I read everything that she writes. Um, uh, what, what was the question? It was about how it informs masculinity. Look, she writes so interestingly about masculinity, particularly those crime books that she follows. So The First Stone, um, Joe Cinque's Consolation, and what was that one with that um, bloke killed his kids? What was that terrible one? Um, anyway, they're, they're fabulous books. Um, uh, Ghana holds such a special place in my heart. I've read everything that she's written except for The Children's Bark because I know it's the best and I'm saving it for a rainy day. Um, and I agree particularly with Ellen Garland's fiction and The Children's Bark, which I think has this beautiful ability to just get places. And I think one of the things about being Australian for me 
is the sense of place. And that includes interiors, not just exteriors, but you know, the way it feels to be an Australian person on Australian earth is you know, complex and, and to some extent political, but it's also what makes us us, I think. And so for me, um, female writers, female Australian writers who do that really well, one is Sonia Hartnett, and I think she writes beautifully about um, boys and that book, The Golden Boys, is just breathtaking. Um, I, I like uh, Melissa Lukashenko's book, Too Much Lip, recently, and just because of the way that it captures the place, and, and, and you know, and I, as far as I'm concerned, crows do talk, and I've met them. Um, and, and I think, yeah, and again, Helen Garner as well, with that way, that crystal clear syntax that really informs the kind of female gaze of what you see in men and the character, I think Dexter in that book, is, is a classic example of a flawed man that we can, I think we can all relate to. So those couple from me. Um, can I be the third to say that I enjoy Helen Garner? Um, Alexis Wright. Um, for short stories, which is kind of my domain, I think Paddy O'Reilly is an excellent writer and has a new book out, which is a novel, but I've not read that one. But her collections of stories through UQP are really top rate. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, this panel has pushed us to kind of, uh, to, co to sort of congeal around the idea of the, uh, the male writer, but I'm not in any way in my writing or in my uh, personal life uh, an ambassador for, for men or male writers. I don't go out seeking male writers. I think, um, you know, in my personal opinion is uh, that Alexis Wright is the, the greatest living Australian writer. And uh, uh, the, the, the Macquarie Pen Anthology of Australian uh, Literature, which came out probably 10 years ago now, uh, the, introduction es the introductory essay to that collection says that her, her, her novel, uh, Carpentieri, is probably the most important Australian piece of literature in the 21st century. And I totally agree. I, I absolutely agree. Followed closely by The Swan Book. And then probably by Tracker. Uh, I, I think... Um, uh, you know, it's never been my thing to sort of look for male writers. And I think, for example, Jessica Owl's uh, new book, uh, new novel, uh, Cold Enough for Snow, is probably one of the best Australian novels I've, uh, I've read uh, in a long... I mean, without doubt, is one of the best Australian novels I've read in a long, long time. I absolutely love it. And I think it's a, it's a categorical victory of short form over the novel itself. I think it's a wonderful uh, piece of literature. Um, but I do have to come out in defense of uh, uh, self-destructive alcoholics because I think, you know, they really get a bad rap. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with being a self-destructive alcoholic, uh, except for the damage that it causes to you and the people around you. So uh, that's how I want to end my response today. Thank All right. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. And we're getting the big wind up now, I think, aren't we? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. Very so much. thank Good you, round please. Round so Luke Johnson, Luke Carmen, Tom Patterson, please buy a book. All of our books for sales over there. And there's a signing table at the back, a wonderful dining table. So if you'd like to have your book signed, please come and, and see don't us there. Forget